Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, to our Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends. The part of God's Word that we'll give our attention to this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll read verses 4 to 10. As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of our Lord. I suppose we could put it in the category of coincidence, if you believe in such things. Our building committee here at Bethany, charged with exploring the possibility of constructing a sanctuary on our Lindale campus to help facilitate the move from a dual site ministry to a single site ministry, is ready just a little bit later this morning to present to the congregation an update on the work that they've been doing with this project. And at the same time, this weekend, we get to focus here in worship on the even greater building project that the Apostle Peter spoke about in our verses today. God's project might be viewed as kind of a remodel, or maybe better yet, a complete teardown and rebuild. God had built a perfect structure at the beginning when He created Adam and Eve in His own image and held them in a close and perfect relationship with Himself. But when they disobeyed, when they rebelled against their Creator, that perfect structure was ruined. The relationship was severed. But immediately, God set out to rebuild it. To gather again the people that He so dearly loved despite the fact that they are unworthy of His love. And to restore their relationship with Him. Now the truth is, God is a lot farther along in His project than we are. His plans were established and approved from eternity. The cost for God's project was going to be immense. But He promised that His own Son, Jesus, would pay all that was necessary. Throughout the many centuries then, God shared and promoted His building plan with His people. And then when the time was right, when the time had fully come, God sent His Son. And the real work on the project began. In some ways, we might view Christmas as kind of a groundbreaking. Things were happening to be sure, but it still wasn't much to look at. But then 30 years later, Jesus began His public ministry, preaching and teaching, healing and helping, gathering His disciples, pushing on to the cross, and things were really starting to take shape. Then on that Good Friday, Jesus fully funded the project. There'd be no mortgage necessary, no debt 
that would be left remaining? Jesus paid it all. And then on Easter Day, the cornerstone was laid. Jesus, the living stone, triumphed over sin, death, and the devil. And by his victory, he paved the way for countless other living stones to be added to this glorious structure. And ever since, God has been at work, adding one person at a time to this building through the gospel. And by God's grace, each one of us is a part of that project. Each one of us is a part of that structure. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Because Jesus lives, we are rebuilt on the cornerstone. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it means that we are God's special people. We are each living stones built securely into God's spiritual house. And we are each royal priests called by God to serve in His kingdom. Peter begins like this. He says, As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Again, the spiritual house that Peter is speaking about here is the holy Christian church. And the most important part or piece of this structure is Christ Himself, the living stone. When we hear that word stone, we think of something strong. We think of something solid and lasting. But then when Peter calls Jesus the living stone, we think of function and activity. Jesus is our strong and living Savior. He is that solid foundation for the church, but also the faithful shepherd who guides and guards His church. And that was always the plan. Quoting from the Old Testament, Peter says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen, precious cornerstone. The cornerstones in our buildings today are usually more decorative than formative. Usually they are stamped or engraved with a date, maybe a motto or a slogan. But at this time, the cornerstone was crucial for the construction of building. If that stone wasn't cut well and set straight, then everything in the building would be skewed because everything in that structure was to be lined up on that one cornerstone. And see, Jesus is just such a cornerstone for His church. Everything in the church is to be aligned with Him. It's teaching, practice, it's mission, and it's members. We depend on Him for our salvation. We look to Him for our direction in ministry. When the church is lined up entirely with Christ, then that church is strong, true. The truth is, God wants all people in this world to come into alignment with Christ, the cornerstone, because their eternal salvation depends on it. We heard what Jesus said in our Gospel today. I am the truth, or the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Ultimately, everyone in this world will stand or fall based on their relationship with Christ, the cornerstone. And yet Peter tells us that there are many who reject him. The fact is, no one by nature is in alignment with the cornerstone, not us or anyone else. Rather, God has to bring us into alignment with Christ, and He does that through the Gospel message. But even when that Gospel is proclaimed, even when Christ the cornerstone is shared, still, there are so many people who reject Him. And the result is disastrous. Peter says, to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. We see that same word cornerstone used in this verse here, but in the Greek, Peter uses a different word here, and so it seems like he has a different picture in mind. Rather than the cornerstone, he may be talking about what we call the capstone or the keystone of a structure. That too was a very important one in any building back then. See, these stone arches were built up around a wooden frame. And where they met at the top, that's where the capstone or the keystone would be placed. Once it was inserted, then all the pressure from that arch would rest on that one stone. And that wood frame could be taken out. But if that capstone or keystone was removed, well then everything would crumble. So Peter's message is this. Without Christ, everything falls apart. Obviously, that happens immediately. Whenever Jesus and His Word are blatantly rejected out of hand by people. But it can also happen more gradually, slowly, over time. As a church and its members slowly drift away from Christ and His Word, teachings that maybe seem unreasonable or outdated or out of step with what's going on in the world, they're kind of slowly, quietly pushed to the side. And before long, a lot of other teachings from God's Word find their way out there as well. And so rather than being a source of strength and alignment for God's people, Jesus and His Word become obstacles. Things that cause people to trip stumble, fall. On the other hand, Peter says, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. To you who believe, this stone is precious. Christ is precious to us because we know that it's only through faith in him that we have become these living stones who are now built securely into God's spiritual house. I think it's interesting that Peter refers to us as stones rather than bricks. Bricks are all very uniform, not so with stones. They come in different textures and colors, different shapes and sizes. And yet Jesus takes each one of us, imperfect and different as we are, He washes us clean from our sins. He shapes us just how He wants us to be. And then He sets us in a unique and lasting place in His house. The one who trusts in Him will never be put to shame. So we have this very secure place in God's house. But we also have a definite purpose, a gracious activity that God has in mind for us as His people. You know, when a stone is set in or built into a structure, we don't expect to see any movement from it from that point forward. And if we do, it's cause for alarm. But in God's house, it's different. He tells us that as His living stones, we can't sit still in this structure. Not only are we a part of this building, But God tells us that we are called to serve as priests in this building. And so this picture then takes us back to the Old Testament priesthood that God had established. Those priests also were very special people. They all came from a single tribe in Israel. They were dressed in a special way. They had special access to God. They performed special duties for God offering sacrifices and prayers on behalf of God's people. Each one of them was to serve as a picture of the great priest to come, Jesus himself. Jesus, of course, surpassed all of those other priests by his perfect life, by his intimate access with the Father, by the once-for-all sacrifice for sins that he made on the cross. Jesus' work made the priesthood as it existed before him Unnecessary. All of them were just a shadow, but the reality is found in Christ. It's His work that now provides us the access that we need. It's His work that makes us the priests that God now says we are. 
You remember what happened on that Good Friday when Jesus died. We're told that that curtain in the temple that blocked off access to the most holy place, the place where God promised to dwell with His people, that curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And the message was clear. Through Jesus, through faith in Him, we now all as God's people have this direct access to the Father. We all hold this special status as God's people and as His servant. Peter describes it like this. He says, we are all a chosen people, selected by God from eternity to be His very own. We are all a royal priesthood, sons and daughters of the King, who have been called now to serve the living God in our lives. We are all a holy nation, washed clean from every sin in the blood of our Savior Jesus so that we are perfectly fit to serve our holy God. We are all God's special possession. People belonging to Him. He put His name on us. He made us. And He redeemed us. And so, we have an obligation to Him. Thanks to Jesus, God's promises, He has an obligation also to us. God's obligation to us through Jesus is to forgive our sin, to raise us up on the last day, and to bring us into life everlasting. He promised it. So our obligation to Him then is one of faithful service in His kingdom. To be the priests that He has called us to be. That means that as priests we have duties to perform. We have spiritual sacrifices to offer our God. Not in order to earn His favor. Jesus already did that for us with His sacrifice on the cross. Rather, our sacrifices are opportunities for us to say thank you to Him. For us to glorify His saving name. Peter says that we are to declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness and into His wonderful light. Peter calls them spiritual sacrifices because they are driven by God the Holy Spirit who now lives in us by faith. These things that we do are acceptable to God and even pleasing in His sight because they are viewed through Christ in His perfection. So as these royal priests in God's house, what sort of spiritual sacrifices are we to offer? Of course, there is our regular worship and our prayers. There is our bold and clear confession of the truth. There is our sharing with others of Jesus and His saving love. There are the many good deeds that we do, the generous gifts that we bring. All of these things are the sort of spiritual sacrifices that our God desires from us as His people. But really, there's so much more than that. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. He means to say that everything that we are and everything that we have is to be devoted in some way to service in God's kingdom. Devoted in some way to glorifying God's saving name. And so we go to work with our time and our talents, involving ourselves in the ministry of the church, whether that's in some official capacity or simply carrying out the responsibilities that are common to every member of Christ's church. We put our time and our talents to work to serve in the individual responsibilities that God has, has assigned to each one of us in our everyday lives, whether that's in our family or in the workplace or as citizens of this nation. And the beauty of it is that God uses all of this, whether it happens here at church or happens out there in the world, God uses all of this service by His priests to continue to work on that saving project that He planned from eternity and that one day He will bring to completion for us. We don't know exactly what God has in mind for our building plans here at Bethany. But we are confident 
that God will bless us no matter what happens because we know exactly what He has in mind for those building plans that He established in eternity and put into action through His Son, Jesus. By God's grace, each one of us is already a part of that project, already included in that structure. Because Jesus lives, we are rebuilt on the cornerstone. Because Jesus lives, it is now our privilege to go to work to continue growing this structure larger and stronger every day until that last day when God unveils the finished product for us and for all. You know, the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 21 was granted a vision of God's finished product. And it's awesome. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Because Jesus lives, that's the future that we get to look forward to. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.